Hello and welcome to this special edition of the Africa Now podcast, where we take a fresh look at events on the continent and at how Africa relates to the rest of the world. I'm Martine Dennis. Today, we hear a most fascinating story that starts in the tiny Central African country of Equatorial Guinea, a former Spanish colony. It's a journey that takes our protagonist to North Korea as a six-year-old, and after about 20 years there, to Spain for a decade, then briefly back to Equatorial Guinea, before finally landing here in London. Monica Macias is the youngest daughter of Francisco Macias, he was the first president of an independent Equatorial Guinea. Mathias and Kim have been dubbed two of the most brutal dictators of the 20th century. An African girl growing up in Pyongyang is remarkable. There were very, very few black people in North Korea. And that's why Monica's journey has been one of discovery, to find her true identity. But she tells me even now, in her 50s, Although she is African on the outside, her soul is Korean. And, as you'll hear, she's also committed to finding out more about her father's time in office and why he's accused of being responsible for the deaths of up to 80,000 people, earning him the nickname the Pol Pot of Africa. I'm very happy to be talking to... Monica Mathias, very, very lovely to see you. What an interesting story. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for having me in your show. And uh, thank you very much for reading my book, get it interest of, of my story. It's the most fascinating story, and, and um, not least because there, there's there's something completely remarkable about the fact that an uh, an, an African girl and her siblings mm -hmm. land up in North Korea with very few other Africans um, and become in many ways more Korean than African. <laughs> I mean, what was it like being at a Korean boarding school, which was quite militaristic, wasn't it, in terms of the discipline and the daily routine? Yes. Um, so we were sent to study in North Korea. My father, uh, my father being Francisco Macias, the first uh, independent Equatorial Guinea. He sent us in late seventy, and actually it was mid seventy when when he sent us uh, to study in North Korea with uh, Kim Il Sung, the former North Korean. Um, President and Kim Il Sung sent us to study in this uh, military boarding school where we were inculcated um, the values like uh, self awareness, discipline, which was exactly the same discipline as a soldier, and uh, Confucian values. Of the life, so it was quite. In the beginning, it was quite difficult to coming from Africa and placed in that such a completely different environment and growing up there. What what are Confucian values? I would say um, respect to elderly people, authority, and uh, harmony. Just. Uh, very much Asian, being in harmony with the nature. And um, yeah, all this, mainly this kind of, of values. And, and the discipline. Um, having read your book, I was quite taken by the, the, the routine. It was quite a, a, a rigorous routine, wasn't it, to life when you were at school as, as, as a young girl? Yes. So there was, we would, we would in the morning wake up like five o'clock in the morning and uh, do exercise based, consisting of running the 
the boarding school, the campus. And uh, after that, we will be pre preparing for the breakfast. And then we will, will go to the restaurant, marching and singing in Korean, to go to the restaurant and uh, have breakfast. And after that, eight o'clock, we would start the class um, with a break until two o'clock. And after the two o'clock, after that, we would go again for the lunch. Again, in the same way to the restaurant, marching and singing patriotic songs. And uh, after that, we would come back and we would start our homework. And once we finish the homework, we have a break we, where we would play all kind of play. That's very typical Korean um, young people play. And um, after that, and at nine o'clock, we, we would go to, to bed. So that was the routine every day we were doing. Um, we, we talked about it being um, a military boarding school. You actually learned how to handle weapons as yeah. well, didn't you? Yes, I did. So I learned how to handle a pistol and also uh, the Kalashnikov. I, did. I was able back then able to dismantle and again to put it back. Well, I suppose this is a skill that might come in handy in the future, do you think? <laughs> considering, <laughs> considering what's going on around the wall, mm. uh, it might be. Um, another, uh, another element of the, of the discipline um, was the fact that you very early on developed the habit of diary writing, yes. which formed, I, I presume, it formed the basis of, of, your, of the book. Yes, absolutely right. So I was inculcated since we were young, uh, writing a diary. So we used to write every day about while reflecting also what we are thinking and also to improve our writing skills. So I have that habit since I was young and I have been writing my diaries about my life. And although now I write less <laughs> compared to that back then. And uh, yes, that's one of the discipline we were inculcated there. And it, like you said, it helped me to write this book in Korean version, whether it's Korean version or English version, that helped me a lot. And of course you were writing in Korean, weren't you? Yes. So Korean very quickly became your first language? Yes. I, because I, so in order to understand this, I need to put you in the context that when, when we arrived in, uh, in Pyongyang, my mom had to leave us because of what was happening back in Equatorial Guinea. So she disappeared overnight. It, from, from my perspective, I'm talking about. And then I, I lost the memory about what happened, how it did happen. Uh, the moment she was leaving, I mean, I mean. So I, that reflected on me as a rejection to, toward everything related to my, um, what is supposed to be my culture, the Kuduruginian culture or Spanish culture or whatever, everything about my mother, I was rejecting it because I was angry with her because I couldn't see her. She disappeared. I could understand. I was... It's a kind of, a kind of trauma. It was a kind of trauma. Uh, yes. From the way you've described it in the book. Yes. Your, your mum disappearing from your life. Yes. Quite literally for a long period of time. Yes. And so you sort of rejected everything you knew about home, which yes. was Equatorial Guinea, and you also rejected your language, which was yes, Spanish. Yes, absolutely. I rejected everything. Even even I rejected my skin color. I didn't want to have this skin color. My hair, I hated my curly hair. So even the language, I mastered Korean in, in two months. I, I was Korean, absolutely. For me, I was kind of in a mission to become a Korean. That really speaks to you having had a very forceful character, a forceful nature, 
at that young age to mm. have been so deliberate mm. about that. Yes. Um, what's also obviously really, really interesting is what does it, what is it like to be a black girl? Um, and I know that you had your siblings with you for a bit um, in, uh, in Korea, North Korea, where there are very, very few other black people. Mm -hmm. So it, it is, it was difficult in a sense that North Korea, well, I would say Korean society, both Korean are very much um, monocultural society. Now even South Korea, Seoul is becoming more open to other cultures and other migrant, but still is very strongly monocultural society. And North Korea is more than South Korea. Then. So it was very difficult, but um, because they have not been in a opened to others, um, um, exposed uh, to black people. So they would come to me and touch my hair, my 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 hand, skin tone, look at. So in that and even in school, it was more difficult because children, you know, they are very blunt. They would say what they think. They don't, yeah, they don't have a filter. So they would call me as um. Uh, there is a cartoon character called the ship wife, because. You know the sheep have the hair, curly hair, so they used to call me. And that in the beginning is it was a crisis of I had this crisis of belonging, because inside me I am I mastered language, and I speak like them. I I I wanted to be like them, but then they don't see me like that, like them. So rejection, that rejection. So it made it very difficult in the beginning. But then once you pass that phase, you become friends. For instance, when I, I realized that when I, I um, just was in a hunger strike, because I went to hunger strike, I, I didn't eat anything for a month, only was, water. Was this because of your sense of abandonment? By yes. Your, it, well, it, you, were, you were depressed. Yes. It was mainly, I think it was because my mom left, so I couldn't bear that I, my mom wasn't there. And I think it was many, many elements all together, but the main elements was that my mom is there. I missed her so much. And then, um, yeah, so I just went to, through a hunger strike and I was taken to the hospital. I think it was one or two months. And then when I came back to school after that, everyone was, was so happy to see me. They were relieved that I was alive. And, and that's made us very strong, tight. There was acceptance. They accepted yes. you yes. At this, by this point. Yes, absolutely. So that's a uh, wall of the um, difference just crumbled. So I. Um, so, yeah, although it was difficult, it was, I was able to uh, adapt and overcome. Well, I think um, that uh, I, I know many uh, African mm -hmm. uh, girls and boys, actually, who were sent here to mm -hmm. the UK to mm -hmm. boarding school mm -hmm. and had similar experiences. The difference, I guess, would have been language insofar as obviously using uh, the same language mm -hmm. um, and not having to master a new language for most of them. But I've heard so many stories of, of girls in particular being almost ridiculed for their skin, colour, and, and obviously having a different texture of hair. So, you know, that's, I, I think, something that is not necessarily unique. However, mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, you know, this being in North Korea is still absolutely um, unfathomable to most of us i mean i've never been to north korea mm. um what were the what were the what sort of conditions were attached to your mixing with koreans because as i understand it um they generally like to keep foreigners with foreigners and not and they don't really allow they don't like koreans to be mixing with foreigners is is that was that the case for you no, um so there is a rule for north korea 
it, there is a rule in North Korea that um, separate the foreigners and the, the Koreans. So it's not in order to go, for instance, if I wanted to visit my friends in their house, I needed to go through a monumental bureaucratic um, paperwork. So in other words, I need permission. Ooh. And that permission is a complicated one because they have this rule that people, they, they don't want Korean and foreigners to, to get mixed. But you know, Korean at the same time, North Korea is a very, um, what the rule says is not what actually happening. So okay. underneath of the, uh, and, under the table, things happen. Um, so were you able were you able to develop close relationships? I mean, yeah. So you're missing your mum. You're yes. missing um, you, your siblings are quite a bit older than you, weren't they? Mm. So you were able to make close Abs relationships. With yes, absolutely. I have my best friend Koreans. Yeah, I was able to. But what I'm saying is that within the context that we were given, makes sense. For instance, where we should be seen, where the in dormitory or in school, not beyond that. That's what I mean when I'm saying that. So within that given context or uh, place, I was able to develop a very good relationship and friendship. Without them, I don't think I would have been able to, to survive because, like I said, because I grew up in school, friends are my family. They become my family. So. Um, what were conditions like? So. Um, because you, you've described how um, you and the other African kids ate in a separate room, you had your own sleeping quarters, so you didn't actually integrate with the Korean children uh, when, when you were in the school. We did integrate within given uh, parameters. parameters with the restrictions. For instance, Restriction will be this one. We were eating in a separate room, but then in a class, we were together. When we are playing, we were together, playing together. But it doesn't mean I was able to go to their room without permission, uh, not to their room, their house without permission. That's uh, there is There was a boundary is what I could do, what I could not do. One... Um... One thing that really struck me throughout the book, um, but particularly at this time when you were at school, and that is this sense of loneliness. Mm. You seemed to have to, to have dealt with loneliness from quite a young age. That's absolutely true, yes, because it's, it's linked to the same point we were talking right now because of the restriction. So I... Um, I felt very much lonely and also in a in a in an alien country, which is became my country as well. Part of me because Korea, North Korea has become my country. This the place I grew up, where I have friends. But at the same time, I felt loneliness because of these restrictions that I had, not a being able to go to my friend's house freely without going through all this bureaucratic paperwork and uh, missing my mom uh, and not knowing at all about where I come from, my culture that is uh, rooted in Africa. So all this in this context, when you look at this context. So I, I was uh, wondering uh, um, where I come from, who I am. It's a very, very confusing position to be in for a, for a young girl. Um, did you know anything about Africa, or what was what was known generally at school, or, uh, and and in Pyongyang, even outside of school, was anything known about Africa? Right. So, I can only talk from my perspective. So, what I knew about Africa was the. The only thing that I was seeing in 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 the the news in on TV, when so we're talking about eighties, 
when um, Ethiopian famine happened. So, like I said in the book, the TV uh, presenter would say, uh, they would show the, these very um, heartbreaking images about Ethiopian, and then they, the presenter would say, we need to um, be collaborating with these people and help them. So it was very poor, in my mind, Africa was a very poor continent where we have this obligation to help. That's all I knew about, about Africa. So in other words, other than that, I was really ignorant about Africa. It's quite astonishing, actually. I'm just trying to put myself in your shoes. It must have been a very, very isolating uh, and, and confusing existence, not knowing not knowing the reason for your blackness in a way mm. uh, as, uh, as i say you know there are there are um similarities with a lot of people who are not necessarily in their country of origin but um i tell you what i found particularly interesting um is when it came for you to go to university you rather fancied yourself as a pianist and wanted to do music didn't you but kim il sung uh, the man who was your um, benefactor, um, he advised you not to do music. What did he advise you to do and why? So he said, <laughs> like you said, yes, I wanted to be a pianist, very fancy. And uh, he said, no, you need to learn a technical uh, something that you can use in the future to build your country that can be beneficial to to your country and his because that what my father wanted because when we were sent to to pyongyang we were sent with two letters one for my for us and the other one for kim il -sung. and my father uh, made it clear in that letter that he was sending us with the Kim Il Sung, where Kim Il Sung would uh, decide where to send us for study. And then when we finish studying, we should go back to Guinea and work for Guinea to building the Guinea. And that could be beneficiary for the country. So that's the reason why Kim Il Sung advised me to study anything but not a pianist not becoming a pianist. So he he suggested a word about uh, learning uh, uh, textile engineering, which is what I what I decided to I end up studying. What is textile engineering? So textile engineering basically I'm engineer, I'm able to manage a a, a factory of textile, that's fabrics, they make the fabrics and uh, yeah, so management, basically. But I do understand the process of that I, because I studied. It goes to a studying about the fashion and then how the textile is, is made of and then how you, you, you can uh, manage the, the fabric, um, the factory of it. Um, so you did that at university, then come, I think it was 1994, you were given the option, um, all of you children, because your, your siblings also, when they finished studying, they were also given the option of staying and, and, or leaving? Yes, correct. And you decided to, to leave? Yes. Um, the reason I started, I decided to leave is because it, as I was growing up, I started to having this strong um, feeling of, well, I would say immersed in an in a identity crisis. So I wanted to know where I come from, uh, what is my background, I, I wanted to know. And uh, I first decided to learn the language because the language is the tool of everything because not speaking um, other language because back then I was only speaking a bit of English and then Korean. So I studied Spanish 
And after six months of the, the Spanish course in Pyongyang, I left Pyongyang and I headed to uh, uh, Madrid. And um, before and um, before we go into your your periods uh, in in Spain, um, tell me about that incident, which I I think is quite seminal for you, when your mum returned to Pyongyang mm. to visit you after some years mm. apart, and you realised, or well, she realised as well, that you actually didn't share a language because you'd lost Spanish and you only spoke Korean. Yes, so it was quite um, dramatic events when my mom came back uh, to visit us after about four or five years after she had to leave and go back to Guinea. And she came back after five years, about four and five years, she came back to Pyongyang to visit us. And by then I was completely stranger. I we were stranger because I couldn't speak Spanish and uh, I could only communicate in Korean and she she did she didn't speak Korean so when she came and she, the 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 plane landed in the airport and I saw her walking down from the, the, the air, um, aircraft. The only thing I could say was very beautiful lady, but I did not have a feeling like that's my mom and run to her. My siblings did it and they were crying, but I, I didn't have that same feeling and um, that made her cry more. She was very sad. And she thought I was doing it on purpose. And uh, that's hurt me a bit because it wasn't on purpose. I completely forgot Spanish and couldn't communicate with her. So you spoke with your siblings yeah. in, in Korean? In Korean. We still do. We still <laughs> speak in Korean. So my sister became our translator between me and my mother back then. And... Uh, that's how I communicated with her during my childhood when I was in Korea. I get a sense that um, this rather f sort of fractured relationship with your mum mm. um, was something that that continued throughout throughout uh, your life, and it's and it's also quite an important part of who you've become is this this um, fractured relationship with your mother. Yes, it it's. It affected me a lot, I, I would say, very much. And uh, so we had a very complicated relationship because of that. And um, and the last time I, uh, I spoke to her, well, we didn't speak, we fight. I was very... Uh, I'm very stubborn. She also was a very strong woman and stubborn. So each of us, although the what we aiming was good, because we were so strong characters, um, I wanted her to see what happened from my perspective when she left as a young child. For a young child, what matters only the mother, because the mother is the wall for a young child. And when she disappeared, to me, it was like the wall crumbled. And I became, that's the reason I became very rival, very unrespectful with the authority at school and so, so on. So you went through a very rebellious a phase. A rebellious you, phase, yes. yes. Although I overcome that. And, um, and from my mother's uh, perspective was, she wanted, me to see it from mother perspective that's had to leave own children because your your mother felt that she had to go back to equatorial guinea in order to protect your eldest brother yes, to be there right? with yes that's correct right what uh, i mean very not long after you arrived in pyongyang of course you got the news that your father had been executed did you know about i knew your, your father 
about what he was accused of? I knew nothing about him. I, I, that happened when I, when I was six years old. So I knew, seven to be honest, I knew nothing about him. And I have no memory about him. It's a, it's a fraction of memories that's just his image, but it's the back I remember. That's the only thing I remember, but I knew nothing. Everything I know, I learned it later when I was adult. So 1994, and uh, you decide you need, to, you need to speak the language of your family, yes. of your background, and so you go to Spain. Mm -hmm. And I go to Spain, and uh, as I landed to Spain, I still remember in Barajas Airport, the first um, struggling um, people <laughs> um, in a migration, police migration in, in the airport, they didn't believe me that I were not able to speak Spanish fluently because my, although I did uh, six months of course in, uh, in Pyongyang, my Spanish was not enough to let's say, communicate fluently with them. Yes, classroom Spanish as yes. opposed to live yes. Spanish. Exactly. So I was struggling. I rather wanted a English speaker. So they couldn't believe that a, a, a girl who had an Equatorial Guinea passport yes. couldn't speak Spanish. Yes. <laughs> they, well, it's, it's quite unusual, <laughs> isn't it? That's true, that's true. And they couldn't relate but how come with this passport you are not speaking Spanish? They thought I was just kidding and I was... <laughs> but in the end, um, after five hours of background checking and everything, they, they had to believe me and let me go. But it was the moment, the first shock coming, uh, first impression when they, they, they saw my passport Guinean, Equatorial Guinean passport, the first thing they came was, oh, this is the country where Francisco Macias, the dictator, and they were uh, bad-mouthing. It was the first time I, I was like, oh, I came across of the bad reputation about my father in the West. And it was quite painful. And not knowing what to believe, who is telling the truth, what's the truth, I, I did not have any um, guidance and everywhere I go, what I heard, it was just, but nothing about Matthias. Well, um, yeah, I mean, your father was uh, generally known as mm -hmm. a dictator. Some mm -hmm. even called him the Pol Pot of Africa. Mm -hmm. The allegations are that he was responsible for thousands of deaths and mm -hmm and thousands of people leaving the country. Mm -hmm. um, you decided that you wanted to get to the bottom of this to find out the truth. Yes, I, I wanted, I don't take um, everything what is said, the narratives, narratives for the face value. So how did, so you, you started a program of research. Mm -hmm. What did you discover then? What I dis discover it was that, uh, Matthias, many things what he is accused of and uh, what is written in the, uh, the, the report of the trial, which is basically the, the report is written in a in not very legal term. It's very much, in my opinion, in my opinion, in my opinion, and, and a legal report shouldn't be based on opinion, it should be based on the fact. And what I find out is that many things, like he climbed in his, uh, by him I mean Matthias, he climbed in his uh, last speech, many things happened behind him. And, but, like he said, he was, he took the res uh, political responsibility because th those uh, happened during his mandate. 
so that make very different. That's the, a, a huge difference that sometimes many people just dismiss. So he said that he wasn't personally responsible mm. for much of the for the killings. Yes, but he took responsibility because they happened on his watch. Yes. And what do you think is the truth of that? What I think I will, I will put it in a very clear way in my third book. Can't wait for that. <laughs> um, and you are known pretty much as, as the woman who has been brought up, if you like, by two of perhaps the most reviled men in history. Mm. I mean, what a, um, what a title. Mm. It's something, is it something that you feel that you have to push back against? Uh, you mean push back about about how I'm, feel, I'm feeling, or the yes, time? about about well, about the you know the the general characterization of these two men mm. who've been so important in your life. Yes, well, then that's the reason I did a master degree in international relation in at SOAS here in London to understand why is that, and um, it's a power relation. If we understand the power relation. We understand why those two men that are important in my life are character characterized in that way. Because I give you an example why I see it's, it's, it's a power relation. Winston Churchill. If I ask her to a British, white British, about Winston Churchill, many of them for them is a hero. While if I ask the same question, to non-white, whether it's British or others, they would say a villain, a muscular. I did a master degree in international relations and diplomacy, where I was able to put my experience and my research about my father in a in a um, academic context. And through this master degree, I learned. Uh, about Foucault's um, theories about the narratives, how it works. In fact, he have very excellent, brilliant essay about the order of discourse. He, it was as I was reading that essay, I was like, I was feeling like Foucault was writing exactly about my father's. Um, story. So how did Foucault and that particular essay help you understand your father better? So that what Foucault says is what is the power is related. Power, first of all, he defined that power is everywhere and especially the power, how the power affect the narrative, how they influence strongly the narrative. So who, those who have power and if they say something, the powerful man, that will be accepted. accepted they control as, the narrative. Yes, they, in, in other words, they control the narrative. narrative. That's uh, accepted as the power. For instance, I will give you an example related to my father. So during Mafia's trial, um, the ICC reporter, International Court Justice, ICJ, was invited to... To monitor, to see the, to monitor the, the, the trial, and he wrote a, a, a report about it, and his report was basically based on on the uh, his opinion. In my opinion, in fact, if you read it, whether in Spanish or in English, he said every time, "In my opinion, in my opinion, in my opinion." But his that report is accepted as the, the, the truth, the, the, the irrefutable truth for in a Western society. No one argue that that report might be sloppy one, no one. Because why is that? Behind this reporter, there is a big Western institution called ICJ. Sure. And ICJ have power. And that power, if ICJ says yes, Everyone else believed that, and no so, one argued that. And that's what Foucault says when it comes to the 
Well, so what did yeah. that report say? What did the ICJ monitor, yeah. uh, what, did, what did he say in his report? In the report, he accused Matthias de Rissuspit. So he, he uh, actually uh, is putting in uh, the accusation during the trial to Matthias. He was accused of killing people in Black Beach. He was accused, among many other six, I think it was six accusations, seven or six accusations, one of them is this and uh, perpetrating atrocities in the country and burning the, uh, a village and uh, the money, uh, stealing the money, which many of them, there, there was no proof of that. In the end, they couldn't prove anything of all this accusation at all. So the, trial, the trial was flawed. Uh, yeah, it was a mainly show, a show. A show trial. Yeah. A short trial, but is that taken as a true because this reporter represents ICJ? And and then the powerful country Spain reported about mafias and many many things based on the false account. But who are you gonna believe? Spanish, the country as Spain, that is Western a powerful country or small country in Africa. And the former colonial master. A former colonial master. So you see the asymmetric power relation there. That's what Foucault is talking about. And in his order, the order of the discourse in his essay. So you believe then that your father did not carry out these uh, atrocities that led to some, some say up to 80,000 people having no. having died. No. no. I'm confident to tell you, no, it wasn't him. There's a, in the back, there are more complicated story behind why. And that's what I will be explaining in academic way in my book. So you, you, you went about this, uh, this research, didn't you, in, with a professional kind of uh, fervor didn't you, mm. your research? And you've spoken to thousands of people yes. to, to, to get your evidence together. Yes, I did uh, interview more than, I would say more than 3,000 people. I interviewed them, but I cannot tell you because many people asked me not to mention them. Well, Equatorial Guinea today is still not a very uh, free society, in my opinion. Um, what is your relationship with the country like today? Well, I do go to the country. It's my country as well. It's the place I was born, where my family is still there. And uh, when my brother passed away, I was there for the funeral. And my, when my, my, mo my mother passed away, I was there for the funeral. So I do, I do have that, that relation, I would say. Do you feel African now? I think, if I'm honest, I first feel I'm, I'm Korean because it's the culture I grew up with. And then I am, at the same time, I am African and, and European at the same time, I believe, because it's the culture I adopted as an adult later. So even I try to be hard, to be like them, first of all, they don't see me like African. Whenever I'm in, in Guinea, they don't see me like African. In a way, I, I, am, my be, I behave, I talk, my body language. So it, it's kind of, which I understand, although they say, oh, oh you are, you are you're African because your parents were African and, and uh, I have also European ancestry. But this sense of belonging in Africa is very difficult to me, being, having this color, the kind of mix. So, yeah, but going back to your question of, I feel more Korean in a way I, I grew up, and then African and European in the same. Would you consider returning to Pyongyang, for instance, and living there? Um, 
I'm not sure, but definitely I would love to going back and visiting my friends. Um, sometime soon, I would love to. And what about Spain? Do you feel do you feel comfortable in Spain? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Because you spent what, a decade there, did yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I, I want to make this clear. I don't hate Spain. It's not about hating people, Spanish. Or, no, it's just the government of that era. They made such a colossal mistake with my father. That's wrongdoing, and it should be acknowledged. That's something, when something is wrong, it should be acknowledged if we really want justice. Mónica, Macías, muchas gracias. De nada. <laughs> gracias a usted. Mónica Macías tells her amazing story in her book Black Girl from Pyongyang. It's published by Duckworth. That's it for this edition of Africa Now. Let me know what you like, what you don't like. Africa Now podcast, all one word, at gmail.com. I'm on X or Twitter, at Martine Dennis. You can follow us on Instagram too. Remember to subscribe and give us a rating wherever you get your podcasts. We recorded this with the technical skills of Matthew McConway and Busby is our producer. Our original music is by Enric Adam. Thanks for your company. See you in the new year.